I don't think we should talk about oh, this. Come on, why not? People might misunderstand what we're trying to say, you know? No, but that's a part of life. From a mental perspective, then you you got the the take or the inside tip on the the Curtis Jones situation. So what's um what's the story there? Obviously, he's a very talented young man. He's he's come on to the scene and he's just come into his first senior game. He's on the edge of the box. It's nil nil. Everton have had a few chances. Everton have got their their senior team out. Liverpool have got a lot of young lads. So Everton were expected to win the, for the first time in a long time in that derby. But it's sort of like the balls come out to him. He's Flicked it past a defender onto one of the four players, and they've passed it back to him on the edge of the box. And he's just opened up and whipped it into the top corner, barring in. You know the celebrations that followed were, you know, were pretty pretty epic. So, what what I wanted to discuss about that in terms of mental performance is the fact that this is a young man looking to get into the best club side in the world. You know, they've won the World Club Cup, they won the Champions League. Um, it looks like they're going to win the Premier League. Yet, he's stated in the interview afterwards on the pitch um, with Adam Lallana that he was frustrated that he wasn't getting in the team. And I think it went back to the BT studio and everyone was, I think they were sort of shocked a little bit. But at the same time, they couldn't argue with what they'd just seen from him because he'd played pretty well. And he'd obviously scored a, a wonder goal on his debut. So I thought that was really interesting because they were just talking about confidence again, how confident he was. And I think what I got from it was that he was just seeing things completely black and white to him. He, he was in no doubt that he was good enough to mix it on that stage. And people mistake that sometimes for confidence when I think really they sometimes players know their level is better than the lads they're playing with maybe in the reserves. And when they go into the first team, they're doing things which they can see are at the same, if not better, than players in their position. So they're like, why am I not playing? So I guess like I like maybe other people who haven't seen the game or didn't see the goal, even or the epic celebrations, it got me curious now. <laughs> um, but um, but I'm, I'm getting from it that, I mean, are you, are you just saying that the old adage applies, really, that if you're, you're good enough, you're old enough? Exactly. And... And what's the and and so what's surprising about the studio's reaction to that? I mean, if that's if that's true or that's a fact, what what was surprising about it? I think what it what is surprising is the fact that he's not talking about a team that are uh, uh, mid-table. So when Rooney burst onto the scene, he did something very similar against Arsenal, where he sort of opened up and reverse whipped it in the the top corner against David Seaman, and. Um, Cue the epic celebrations again, mate. It's the same sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> thing. Yeah, but yeah, I remember him um, on Sky talking to Neville, saying that he got into an argument with David Moyes shortly after that because he was dropped for a game, but he was only 17. So some of the players are put out by the fact that, like you said, they assume that because he's new to the game in the professional sense and he's a young man, he should know his place, which is something that, um, is kind of rife through football. And I think wider, the wider world sometimes, it's down to if you're a certain age, then you can only come out and say certain things. You can only bring a certain, a certain value on a topic or in a sport. So I think from... So this is kind of like ageism in reverse then you're talking about, is. like a, a youngism. It is, yeah. And it's that thought that this person should know his place when he comes into a new dressing room and there's senior players that have been in the game for, you know, some of them been professionals for, for near on near on 20 years. But he doesn't see it like that at all. So he's got a completely different different view of it. That's the the view that Rooney had. They kind of know they're good enough, so they're like, "What's the mm. problem? Let's get on with it." And, and I, I'm all for that. So what is the problem then? Because these the pundits in the studio are going to have their opinion of whatever yeah. they're seeing, I guess. That anyone with any sort of semblance of logic is going to be looking at it, just judging it on performance, and saying that if you can come on and and produce a a piece of of quality uh, quality football like that um, in a derby game, where supposedly there's a lot more pressure and all the rest of it as well, yeah. um, in the mix, then surely you you can turn up against anybody would be the the natural kind of a bottom line to that. Yeah, you'd think so, and by all means, they were. They were singing his praises, Shearer and the rest of them. But it just got—it just reminded me of a few, 
a few times where, you know, with Alan Hansen saying about the, you win nothing with kids, and I think yeah. it's just yeah. the the cloud that people smear over performance sometimes. They put a reason on top of it rather than just looking at the quality of an individual or the quality of a component in Formula One or whatever oh, it I is. See. I think that we can get a little bit kind of kind of nervous or a bit a bit stuck in our in our way sometimes where we're like this is something brand new this is a brand new player or a brand new um, part or a brand new way of doing things within business yeah and we can get skeptical because it's not had that tried and tested over a long period of time and I think that the reason I say I bring that up is because I think that's what prevents the development of a lot of young players because managers are under such pressure, they feel pressure and they think that it's a big risk going with someone who is younger rather than looking at the pure quality. It's kind of sticking to what I know rather than the unknown. Yeah, so the two the two points you make there, I think, to sort of focus on them, then I guess the latter one, obviously, from manager's point of view, um, yeah, I totally agree with you. I think it that if you're uh, under pressure um, in the league, uh, or even if you're doing well, um, I think you can always fall back if you've played a star player who's had a poor game. The manager can kind of, um, if you like, withdraw some element of accountability or responsibility for it. Um, because yes. he's Wayne Rooney, for example, yes. um, carrying that through, um, then uh, my job is to foregone conclusion. Um, I can't t- get any stick personally or, or criticism for it. But then on the other hand, of course, you've got the, the point you made there about the kind of confidence. And, and this is the kind of funny thing about confidence, isn't it, from a, a pundit's point of view. They can often talk about a team lacking in confidence and what they need to do to get it back. And on the other hand, my assumption here is that you're saying there's a view that maybe this youngster is um, whippersnapper coming in, you know, taking more senior, a place of a more senior um, player. And maybe he's overconfident if he's um, yeah. if he's shown a bit too much bravado, if you like. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore you can't win because obviously these are subjective kind of judgments and, and based on the cognitive bias of the person viewing, if they're thinking that you need to be a certain age or been around the game for so long before you're captain, for example, or yeah. whatever it is, before you've got a regular first team place, blah, blah, blah. That's it, yeah. You can. You, I mean, you do get that. You get players whose outlook on themselves is overconfidence in terms of basically they're not seeing their shortcomings in particular technical aspects of their game um, because they're just blinded by by the the qualities they have so that can work that way but i got i got a real sense he was talking about being frustrated and what i liked about that was that he was frustrated um he said it himself um that he wasn't getting a chance in the premier league because it's a cup game fa cup game uh but he still when he has got the opportunity even if he's feeling that frustration he's still gone out there and given everything he's got um, and what he has got is a very, very high level of of technical uh, ability. So I guess yeah, you're always you're always going to question until you see that. Um, as a spectator, if he hasn't done it ten, twelve, thirteen times, you know, on your on Anfield, whether that was a one off and he is overconfident, or whether he he genuinely is. Um, at the same level as those other other players that are dominating the league at the moment. The only way um, you would know that is if you're Mr Klopp, because um, you'd see it every single day in training. And so how does Mr Klopp play it then? Because, uh, you know, on the one hand, you kind of, as a, as a manager, the last thing you want is a frustrated player or someone who's then looking to uh, get a game every, anywhere else because he wants a first team game. Yeah. And then on the other hand, how do you do it as a player when you're in arguably you know the best team in in Europe right now yeah um it, but you can't get a game but you yeah. want to play regular football do you then move to another team at, mm. you know once once your contract comes up and uh yeah, true. because you want to play first team football because you can have you don't know if they are your golden years like a Rooney if you'd have took those first 3 years of his when he burst onto the scene 
those three years could potentially be deprived from players and playing a handful of games before they're considered mature, um, when really they could have just been ripping ripping up the place, you know. Yeah, exactly. So uh, to me, you can only um, look to play um, play games. That's where you're going to learn the most. That's where you're going to have the biggest impact. That's where you're going to progress your career. So if you're not getting the opportunity after a certain point, and you know, like this lad is saying, he knows he's at that level. You know, I don't. Yeah. I don't know that because I've only seen him in one game. But what I've seen is that he looks like a fantastic player, and I've seen a few, few um, youth team games where he's obviously looked like the best player there. And um, but yeah, you need to play games. You need to. You need to do what it is that that you're um, you you want to do. You're kind of born to do, if you like, what you've spent all that time training for, and that's games. So there's two ways around there. One is kind of being clever and I think if you have the right the right agent and the right guidance you can get in there and let the manager know if he if he's in doubt you can let him know say look I'm ready I'm, is it true or is it am I seeing things differently here or, because I see I feel like in training I'm I'm performing better than x y and z these other players and I think then you'll get a clearer picture of his view uh, why he's not playing you. You might say, well, yeah, that's true, but you haven't got the experience. And then you know that that's a bit of a grey area. You say, well, what, 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 what is experience, you know? I'm either good or I'm not good. We can't go off experience. Pele's got a lot of experience. <laughs> but you're not going to play him on the left wing. So I think it's just getting to know why you're not being picked is a good start. And then if you're making no headway with the manager, you've got to get out. You've got to... Um, You've got to go and play, whether that's on loan um, or a permanent move. So to me, you've got to do your, whatever your craft is. You've just got to keep doing it. Yeah, these are really interesting points to kind of raise because they're pretty universal. You know, when you look at that from a, a business point of view, that really that you know a manager um, of a team in in a business environment might have been a manager for twenty years or whatever, but it's not an indicator of visibility. And no. I think there's there's a hesitance then to promote from within the team or give other people an opportunity to progress the the organisation um, because they're showing talent because they're showing um, you know chomping at the bit basically yeah. you know from what you're saying this guy he's he's kind of not afraid to be in front of the press yeah. or anyone else and saying look I'm a first team player yeah, um, yeah exactly I need to be playing and and in business you've got people doing the same thing that are speaking to maybe their manager's manager and saying, look, I'm not giving a fair crack here. I've come to speak to you because I want to progress my career and move on. Um, and yet there might be, well, you've only been the company for X a period of time or you're only 27 or whatever's the thing um, that's kind of holding them back. And I guess for the individual, it's got to come down to self-awareness then where if, if, you're, if you know yourself and your ability well enough to provide you, you know, an accurate critique of your performance and your ability or talent, um, then that's when you can vote with your feet and go elsewhere and flourish. Yeah. Versus being what what you would class as maybe overconfident or um, you know seeing yourself as a superstar, when in fact you you wouldn't you're not first team material or you're not you're not ready to be in the front line yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just being able to gauge gauge yourself, isn't it, where you're at within a organisation within a team, and then if you're not sure. Um, if you can just ask the right question to, to gauge what how other people see you within that organisation, uh, like you and, said. And you saying that that would be the right strategy for someone or, or any young player listening to this with with a view of thinking I'm not making the breakthrough yet. I, you know I'm good enough. What what should I do? Or in that quandary, they're fed up of sitting on the bench and watching on and, and wondering. Yeah. yeah, I think what, so. What would be the action? What would be the, my, the things that they? Well, my my point of view is. First and foremost, obviously, I'm going to bring this back to to what we know in HX. I think a lot of players get awkward about going to speak to a manager or when they go and speak to a manager uh, or a coach. And it's got to be the manager at the end of the day because he's the guy invariably picking the team, although we have been at clubs where the chairman gets involved in that or a sporting director. You need to go to him, but it's the way you go to him. I think you've got to be um, not overwhelmed by your own emotion, I think. And that's a quality that you can 
is an offcut of, of HX again, that you're able to converse with people without being overwhelmed by frustration or pressure or anger, whatever it is. You know, I think especially with young men that can that can happen. So it's just getting the information from him. Why am I not playing? What is it that I need to improve to get in the team? And then after a certain point, if you're not progressing at that rate where you're making a difference and you're getting chances coming off the bench, then you need to look elsewhere. That's that's my view on it because the most important thing is is the the games. You know, it's the same as in business. The most important thing is if you're a salesman, is picking up the phone every single day. So if someone says, "Well, you 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 can't do that on a particular three days a week," you know, you need to you need to make a move. You know. Yeah, and I think it's these key meetings that can really um, shape a career or, or provide a you know a foot in a, a good direction or a negative one. And I think that certainly from a business point of view, whenever you've been in those kind of meetings, um, I think we've all been in positions where you think you might have given a really good account of yourself or um, you've, you've been clear, you've come out and felt positive about the meeting. And yet, from the, the, the person in the other party, it hasn't been a good meeting or received as well as that. It's a breakdown in communication, essentially. So you can walk away thinking, yeah, it went really well. I think we, you know, we got on just right. And the other guy's thinking, well, he's, he's still not playing. You know, he's gonna, still going to be six months or maybe next season or whatever it is. And yet you're feeling quite upbeat. And I think this kind of breakdown in communication is, is the, the most concerning thing from a performance point of view. That you, you haven't really solved or done anything despite having what seemed like a, a good conversation. I think so. I think the communication is key throughout any organisation, isn't it? Whether that's an F1 team, a, a football club, um, you know, a, someone in the banking industry, whatever it is. Mm. The communication from the top to the bottom allows everyone to be clear of this is what's important to me, this is, this is my values, this is what I'd like to have happen. And we, you can just mm. all get clear about what needs to be done to improve individually and collectively. I think that's all that so people want. You just want a fair opportunity to to climb that ladder or if you're content in your role, you know, you've you've you don't want to climb the ladder, then you just want to you might have your eye on something else. Um, security in terms of this company, understanding how the company works. Is this company going to go out of business? That kind of thing. So it's whatever yeah. you're, you've got your, you aspire to, to do and aspire to create. It's just making that clear to everyone. And I think if companies and, you know, the leaders, the chief execs, the managers, are just open and honest with, with their team, then they'll know, right, this is probably time for you to go. We shouldn't be holding on to you because as mm. much as... Um, the wages might be strong or you get on with everyone here well, you should be on the next level now. You should be in a management role. And I don't think, I don't think you're going to get that here. So I suggest these three companies that you go and have a chat with and I'm going to recommend you. You know? And I'm not sure you get yeah. that all the time, do you? You, get, you just get people not really communicating well. They go into a meeting and they'll... They'll, they'll want to say something and it doesn't quite come out. So I think just being able to communicate and be honest, be open, it carries a lot of weight and it, um, it helps you come together as a team quite easily, I think, get the best out of each other. Yeah, well, I think communication, I mean, that's almost another discussion on its own because it it's, yeah. it's the, the, the one that comes up you know time and time again whether it's within sport or business that people often um they either you know don't feel they're understood even though that they've, they've had a good conversation they get on well with everybody there's not that level of rapport where they feel truly understood or listened to or heard and then on the other hand of course you get people that um that haven't been or felt that they could be emboldened enough to say what they really think so you get 
a manager or colleague feeling they do understand exactly where they are and yet they're holding back um the individual hasn't actually voiced exactly what they think you know so it's yeah. a it's a struggle because then the manager does understand but he's not got to that deeper level um or colleague because they haven't got that that depth of connection or um or, or depth of relationship where you can um say without the fear of criticism or it being taken wrong and that that's a huge huge problem you know because mm. by the time we get too overly diplomatic or start treading on eggshells that just clouds the conversation more uh, yeah than normally just coming straight out with something and and would solve a lot of problems and yet a lot of people do enjoy the drama of ambiguous communication you know, or uncertainty yeah the uh, gossip keeps people on your toes yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's interesting from a gossip point of view or or people from a manager's point of view at letting players or or team members subordinates kind of being a little bit of uncertainty they can think that that's a that's a positive thing yeah absolutely um, because they're keeping them on their toes essentially yeah 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 and to me from from the outside looking in at something like that, it's a complete waste of time isn't it you can see it's completely unproductive but people get caught caught up in that every single day in the office um so there's a big opportunity there to to bring that into line and I think Liverpool, if you look at Liverpool as an example, I think a lot of people are going to be trying to copy them right now. Um, and Klopp's got his own personality. When you saw after that game, you could see that he was just really pleased for, the, for, the, for Curtis Jones and the other young players. You know, he was made up because there was a big yeah. challenge for the younger players and, that, and they came through with uh, flying colours. It wasn't all plain sailing. You know, Everton had chances to to score prior to that quite a few good chances but you could see he was hugging them there was no nothing holding back you know it was it was just you could see they had that connection there um, and I think that that's what clubs are going to start to realise because you cannot miss it when you have somebody who's a Champions League winning club and it looks like they're going to run away with the league that has got a great connection between fans, players, management, um, and you'd hope with the um, the owners as well. So you, the, people are going to start valuing it more and more. Yeah, it's really interesting when you look at management styles and you say people trying to replicate them, what's Klopp doing, what's the missing ingredient, you know. Yeah, what's Pep a, doing. A and... season or two ago, yeah, exactly. They're looking at City and wondering... Yeah. Uh, before that, I was on the other side of Manchester, you know. Yeah. And and it's it's really interesting to think that it comes down to you know a secret ingredient or something um, that you can replicate when, as we illustrated there, that 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 conversation or, or who's the expert changes over a periods of decades, and and even going back to Liverpool managers of old, you know that there you know people were trying to emulate what what was Bob Paisley doing, you know. He's, yeah. And you can almost keep going through the reins that it yeah, changes Clough. and the styles. Yeah, Cluffy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know who might try and emulate Clough, uh, yeah. the Clough management style, but um, but it does show you. Yeah, look at that. That's a great example because Clough was almost, you know, you, you could say the opposite of of where Klopp's at. Yeah, that he was a very serious individual. You know, quite quite dour on a lot of occasions yeah obviously uh, quick witted yeah. um, in terms of the put down but I, and, and he certainly wouldn't be going around hugging players um, at a whim you know so this this is quite interesting um, that there it, it points to the fact that there is no formula yes, um, to follow yeah. or no way to be or no list of behaviours that you need to exhibit in yeah. order to, to win or have high performance and yet all of the time we look outwards to model these behaviours or reverse engineer the latest fashion, which is only fashionable because they're victorious. It's not exactly. fashionable because, for the sake of what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that when you get to see through that, then you've got an opportunity to consider, well, what, what, what can I do? What, what can I do to make a difference mm. for my team, whether that's in, in business or sport, what can I make a, do to make a difference for myself? And you see that every single time having that type of clarity that we'd hope the young man 
Curtis Jones has that I'm not seeing age, I'm not seeing um, ethnic group, I'm not seeing experience. I'm just looking with with an open mind at things. Mm. And from there, but it's interesting that anyone that's that's modelling that, or if he does break through, let's just say he emerges and and fulfils his his yeah. you know apparent potential at first sight. There'll then be players or people trying to model what he's doing. Exactly, they'll be in trying order to, to be a great themselves. player yourself. Yeah, yeah you know, how do you do that? Or, or even even for people in our position, you know, people from looking at it from a psychological or physiological viewpoint. Let's say the data yeah. scientists in the teams, they'll be looking at how much sleep he gets. You know, what yeah. does he eat? And trying to think that reverse engineering all that is the way forward. Exactly, but it's just what it's just an expression of him, isn't it? The same with Klopp and Clough and Ferguson. You just get an expression of them being themselves. Um, and if you're pretending to be someone else, you're just blocking up a a whole capacity to bring something new to the to the table and connect with people and communicate with people effectively and uh, and grow grow together. So that's the trick, isn't it? And that brings us on to sleep, I guess, because um, you know I might might split these up into into a couple of podcasts. Um, this one's been going twenty eight minutes. So I think what we do is we close this one off. Uh, I think yeah. we've had a good chat about performance. I think, in summary, it's not about if you want to progress in your career, if you want your organisation to progress, if you want to progress individually and grow. It's not about copying other people's management styles or performance styles or what, how, they, how they sleep, how they train. It's being open to your own intelligence to know what it is that, that you need. Um, I think that's the key distinction that we've, we've covered here, really. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, you know, essentially it's very simple and yet that's what's going to be so difficult for people to grasp. You know, how do, how do I know who I am and, and how do I express myself fully? Yeah. Um, without the the kind of uh, outside influences, let's say, or, or people who's got ideas of what who who I am and what I should do. Yeah. So yeah, uh, it's, it'd be good subject matter for a, another chat. So yeah, pleasure Absolutely. speaking, mate. And you. Take care. So that's the end of the podcast, and um, yeah, yeah, we'll jump on with another one soon. Take care. Bye. I don't think we should talk about oh, this. Come on, why not? People might misunderstand what we're trying to say. You know, no, but that's a part of life. Yeah.